Testing, testing, T minus. Looks like we're up. Testing one, two, three, looks like we're up. Good morning, good morning. Okay, a bit of an experiment here this morning, as you can see, different setup. Screen mirroring, turn it on. There we go. But we are really, really going to be pushing to Wi Fi. The iPad is casting to the Mac on Wi Fi, and the Mac is sending out. Oh, are we dropping? Are we dropping frames? I don't know here. I've cut one camera out so that we can minimize the problem here. I think at the moment it's running. Is it running okay? Whatever. I have standby work. I have uh, embossing work to do in the background here. If this thing just doesn't uh, just doesn't work properly, see how it goes. How am I, David? I am fine. Thanks very much, guys. Thanks very much. Let's just give this a try, because I really don't know if this is going to be stable, if this is going to work. When we were carving the block the other day, you, you know, I can't get it. When we were carving the block the other day, I realized the faces are really too blurred. I had just pasted down a photocopy transfer. And the faces are too blurred to do really nice, clean work. So we've got the rest of the block finished. But before I do the faces, what I would like to do is go back to the original print. I scanned it in at 1600 DPI threw it into the iPad, and we are now going to, we, we, I, we're not going to trace over here. I've started already. I'm going to trace the key lines of the face and print it out later this afternoon onto Gumpy, try and line it up carefully on that block, paste it down, and then carve with a good, clean, sharp tracing. Paper out? Yes, paper is out for two people up there. Ayumi-san is up there today. She's doing... I don't remember what she's doing. I just took a batch of paper out without knowing what it's for. And Day Chan's out. Day Chan is working on Cats number two, and it is looking great. It's fantastic. There's good news and bad news about that one. It's looking fantastic. The bad news is it's it's going to have to be a higher price than the first cat. There's absolutely no way around it. The amount of blocks and time it's going to take for her to do that. But it is going to look fantastic. Here we have, now look at this, we can see the hairs, how uneven they are. And the question now, how much to fix it? The guy's mandate wasn't to carve just perfect hairs one after the other. It was to carve realistic hairs. These are young boys, they've got a bit scraggly hair. So how much is a mistake, how much is a mess, and how much is good, sensible carving? of what would look like a, a young boy's hair. This one's really fat compared to its neighbors. For the most part, I think I'm just gonna follow what I see in the original. getting used to this iPad. I haven't used this now in a couple of years since I was, did this kind of work previously. The iPad I bought, this one, the iPad Pro I bought for this job when I did the Great Wave, it did that job really well. Uh, no, I didn't use the Wave one, I did the Octopus so when I did the key block for the Octopus on it. The iPad did the job well and then we brought it downstairs to use in the shop and the iPad Pro it turned out to be the, the shop computer, the cash register and stuff. But about a year ago it developed really you know, uh, a battery. The battery uh, grew up and grew up and grew up. and uh, So we took the iPad back to Apple thinking that it was going to be the end of it. It was out of warranty already. And the guy said, sure, you own a battery, no problem. 
So uh, they didn't change the battery on the iPad, they just gave me a refurb, which is what this is. So we got basically, from our point of view, a brand new iPad Pro <laughs> after three years. I mean, people complain about that company and making products that, that decay too soon and stuff like that, but our experience with Apple is fabulous. Yeah. And something just a few minutes ago, let me show you this, because uh, this is not relevant to today's work, but let me just, let me hide for a moment what I'm doing. Let me hide the layer. Let's look at the image here. We talked the other day about this, the fact that how do you tell whether something was made from a metal block originally or from a carved block? Some of the old prints 100 years ago or so were made with metal blocks that people drew or traced or photographed an original and then photographically shrunk it down, had a metallic block made from it through some photographic etching process and then printed. The more traditional way to do it was to draw the hunched very carefully, paste it on a block, carve it, and then print it. And it's very difficult in the finished print sometimes to see which way it was done from. A black key block printed from a metal block or a wooden block can sometimes look pretty much exactly identical. But I talked about this, how we could sometimes see hints when it's done photographically, if someone draws a line and draws a line that crosses it, you get the just perfect image. When someone has carved it, you can sometimes see a shape where the knife has been irregular. And do you see what's happened on this one? You can see, Jeff, I circle it in red for a second. Uh, look at this area. Oh, it's a locked layer. You can see what I'm doing, right in the very middle, right in the very middle, I don't know, right there. You can see, a gap in one of the carved lines, right? And what's done? He's carved the, the kimono lines first, and then he's carved the hair second. And when he's carving the hair, you can see right directly below one of the hairs, there's a gap in one of the kimono lines. And he sliced just a tiny bit too far, and his knife hit the kimono line. Like, impossible. If this had been a metal block, if it had been a photographically reproduced block from a drawing, that line, that gap wouldn't be there. But because you can see this was a carved wooden block, we have little defects like that gap. And they're all over the place, all over the place, all over the place. It's so much fun when I see these, I can realize, ah, Soka, this really is, it really is a carved block on wood. And there's the little mistake that the guy made, which is his, uh, whatever, it just shows me that it was a real person who did this thing. I seem to have changed the color somehow by mistake. I don't know how. I really do not like this stuff. Whatever. Back to red. It's a different red now. What the heck is going on? So this is going to take pretty much most of the day for me to do this, but the end result on the finished print will really show the difference. The, the lines I carve on the face and hair will be confident, they will be sharp. If I carve from the current blurred impression, it's just going to, uh, it's not going to be so good. You talk about the imperfections making it human and all that kind of stuff. I, I, we've talked about this before. I have very mixed feelings about this. I don't want the imperfection. I would like those lines to be, to be perfect, to be carved properly, to be carved clean, to be carved neatly. For me, it's sort of a side benefit that having that impression tells me that actually how it was made. But I don't like the fact that there is a mistake there, you know. 
And of course, this happens in my own work all the time, of course. You know, I, I bring my own mistakes and errors to these things all the time. It's that paradox. And we want it handmade, but we also want it perfect, you know. And this next zone we're coming up to here, it's funny. They've done the, uh, the image as boys, and they've got this sort of top knot kind of a thing where their hair is pulled up at the top into a knot. So they've got a line. Deja vu here. I thought I'd drawn this before. It's just a similar print, I guess. I don't know. We have a line here. When I'm carving this, all these hairs will stop. They will come into this line. couple of broken ones. Let's fix them. So I don't know what uh, news or whatever we've got here from Asakusa today. It's not raining yet today. It's going to be raining a bit later, I think. I have a moderator message here, whatever. Some kind of spam? No? Allow? Delay? Oh, it's... Uh, it's uh Ah, Sokka. <laughs> the message here from the Philippines, there was a word in it that you know, the, the system thought was a dangerous word. So, uh. Good morning from the Philippines. Yes, hello, hello. The Twitch system didn't like the name of your, uh, of your place. It was a dangerous word, it felt, I guess.
is the pen responsive enough? I know you're asking the wrong guy, really. I am not an artist, so I'm not drawing. I'm just tracing something here. From my point of view, I don't know what you're seeing. There's actually a lag here. When I move the screen here myself, I'm going to move it. Boop. You can see that there's a bit of a lag in the, in, the, in the cast here. This iPad is casting to the TV, so that lag is there. But my lag on the screen, when I touch the thing and draw, I can't detect any any lag at all. This for me, this is just, it's just the same from, again, from a non-artist's point of view here. It's just like drawing on paper or anything. Touch and it comes up. I don't anyway really understand how to use this thing. It's, it's much more touch responsive. I think I'm told this, if you turn it at an angle, it also changes the line and stuff like this. I'm just basically trying to trace a line here. But yeah, this is a super tool for me. Absolutely a super tool. I imagine if somebody were, were an artist, a sketcher, you only know, got this in your backpack and you can draw and do stuff anywhere, this would presumably be a, just a tool to die for. Before I got the iPad, I used to use, well, going, going, there's three stages for us of doing this, this work. Before I got the iPad, I was using a, a Wacom tablet not the kind you draw and look on, but I drew on a plastic tablet and they looked at the screen. It took a while to get used to it. After a while, you got it. You draw and look and undo and draw and look and undo. Jed uses one of the ones where he actually draws on the tablet and it shows the image on the tablet. I think it's a Cintiq or something. I forget what it's called. But before that, it was all just paper. I had a light table. My carving bench had a glass screen on part of it. And I had a light bulb on the floor under my carving bench. My old carving bench, it's still there in Ome. And to do these jobs, I would get a printout of the thing I wanted to trace. Of course, enlarge the print out of the thing I wanted to trace. Put gumpy paper over the top of it, tape it down, and go for it with a brush. With a, you know, a, wet, a wet ink brush. And when you screw up, you got to cut up a piece of gumpy, stick it on top, and go over it again. You know? In the, in the drawers and in the boxes over in Ome, I have like 25 years more. All the prints, the 100 poets, the Suriwano albums, I have like full giant one meter wide gumpy sheet tracings of all of the key blocks for those prints. Insane amount of work it was. Absolutely insane amount of work. Could ask, what is Dave doing? Dave is creating a new tracing. We're going to have to go back and forth on this. The current block that I've been carving recently, it's all finished now except for the faces. But when I look through my microscope, I can see the hair and the eyes and the nose. They're really quite blurred. I didn't trace for this one. I just took a photocopy of the original print and shrunk it down and pasted it. And the lines are, of the face are really too blurred. They're not clear. I could carve something. I could you know, put something in there, carve some kind of eyes. But I really want this to be as close as possible to the original. So we've stepped back for a moment. I took the print I have, took the print I have yesterday, and scanned it, scanned the faces, at I think 1600 DPI, brought it into our system, prepared a Photoshop file, cast it over to the iPad here, and what I'm doing is I'm now tracing an extra layer. I can erase it here for a moment. I'm tracing a layer, there's the picture, and I'm tracing a layer on top of this thing. And after I'm finished this afternoon, I will export the red layer here, print it out separately, shrink it to the correct size, and line it up and paste it on top of that block, and get carving again. And that will give me much more clean, accurate data on where to carve these boys, hair, eyes, and, and facial features. I should have done this back at the beginning when I started preparing this print a few years ago. 
but I figured, I think at that time I figured I can get away with it, it's okay. And I, I was too optimistic. And I'm, by doing it here at like 400% enlargement, we can get a good shape for these lines. Now the lines you see here, this will be shrunk down. It's 400% right now, so these will be shrunk down to a very, very, very fine layer. Not so, not so interesting to watch, I'm sorry, but it's an important part of my work. Oh yeah, this looks like a Venus flytrap. Sorry, you're just seeing part of it. I'm at 400%. Can I, uh, whatever. This, this is the boy, and it's one of the boys from that, uh, from that print. This is 100, there were, there's 100%, but 100% means 100% of the 1600 DPI resolution, you know, so. Yeah, you're seeing pixels because we, there's, the, I myself, I now can no longer see pixelation here because this is at 100% of the scan. And now it's interesting, but you're seeing pixelated. I'm seeing over on the cast image on my laptop, I am seeing heavy pixelation. On the app, on the screen here, I'm seeing very sharp. And we just got too many transitions of video here. Anyway, on my screen, it is extremely sharp. Pull it up to 200, pull it up to 500, pull it up to four. We're at 400 now. And actually, I'm still not, I'm seeing some blurriness, not seeing pixelation so much as blurriness. And I can easily work at this level. You're seeing much more pixelation, I think, than I'm seeing. I think it's just part of we're casting video to a video and then casting video out again. I'm actually seeing it quite a lot sharper than it looks to be on the, on the computer there. I said it for 1600, but I think it's a fake 1600. You know, scanners always use these numbers that are really not something real. We have a, it's a flatbed A3 scanner. We use it for scanning the prints for the flea market. And it's pretty old fashioned, I know. The new scanners, I really, really do not like new scanners at all. They do what they can to erase the background. And when we're scanning prints, we'd like to have some paper texture and stuff. Speaking of which, did you see the new prints in the collection yesterday? That was good fun. The Akashiban Surimono. This, how long was it going to take? It's going to take me whatever. I'll, I'll be finished at lunchtime, I think. I don't know. Not so sure. Not sure. This is no big deal. I'm just doing the, the faces here. Two faces, that's all. The rest of this print is already done. And, uh, before I forget, though, those are uh, the, the prints we put up yesterday. Rosan has been working on... Uh, mokohankan.com slash I'll probably get this wrong let's see if I get it right or wrong I don't know let's see something in the middle there, just a minute. Yeah, there is.
Okay, let's work on the main here. We can see too where we he broke some, or maybe that was broken. One of these hairs is broken, you can see. Those prints I put up over the weekend, you know, the ones in the collection, I just put the link in there right now. Uh, I was playing, as I was doing it, I was playing with the angle of the light, and some of them I got to, oh, I got carried away. I like having the angled light so we can see the, you know, the texture of the paper. But some of the prints I put up over the weekend, when I came back and looked at them uh, last night, I realized that I had got a bit too carried away, and the angle of the light was just too, too steep and the prints look just a bit grotesque rather than just attractive so so I'm gonna shoot some of those again I want to see paper texture I want to see embossing but when it becomes that's all you can see instead of seeing the print itself then it's too much so. you get addicted to that stuff and just keep on you know, cranking it up and cranking it up and whatever. Yeah, I think this was the octopus, Ken. So I, that's the last time I did, did, did this. It would have been, what, three years ago or something? I don't, I don't know. Last night when I was getting ready for the stream, I got all this stuff out, dug up the iPad, which I haven't used here for, for months, tried to remember what software, how did it work. Nothing was charged. I couldn't remember the password to get into the machine. Seems the video it's holding its own, right? It dropped a few frames at the beginning, but now we're all right. It's carrying fine. And this hair, this is the switchover point for this face. The hairs are curved one way. They're all curving to the left or to the right, whichever point of view it is. And then from this next hair, they're now curving the other way. So this face has a specific place where it's easy to see. Sometimes it's a bit more difficult to see where the transition happens. What's the software? There's no specific software here. I know I'm drawing in what's called Pixelmator. It's a, a Photoshop clone. And what I've done is the, the image that was scanned in is the base layer. 
So the base layer is there, the image is there. I have a, a, a layer on top of it which is set to 50% opacity. I can change that for a moment. If I change this, the red layer, if I change it to full opacity, then the problem is I can then I can't see the part underneath. So I want to see both. I want to see the thing that I'm drawing. I also want to see the black lines underneath. So we set this to 50% opacity. And then before I, I sign off on the whole thing, I'll put it back to, I'll crank it up to, I'll crank it up to full opacity again when we're finished all of this. I'm not going to do this right now. And you can go through and you can see places where it looks a bit funny, where the curve is a bit wrong or something like that here. That's different from this one. So at the final stage, just go back in and touch up and touch up and touch up. And I'll use the eraser. I'll make some of these a bit thinner. I'll make some a bit thicker. You go back and touch up before, as I said, before I sign off on the thing. But while I'm drawing it, I keep it at 50% opacity. Which question? I sent the link of a website with an image of the silkworm print thing. I haven't seen that. You mean you sent the link in the chat here or to me in an email? I haven't seen that, or if it's over the weekend, if it went to the main Mokohankan email box, nobody looks at that. Cameron's off for the weekend. So he's back on Monday. It may come through this way. So one way or the other, if that's what you've done. I know, chat people, thanks for answering. I guess there's questions here from people who are new to this. Thank you for answering very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So cool, a bot to answer and human beings to answer. Can't tell the difference. I think if I were good at this, and as far as using a Japanese brush goes, these tools, this pencil and stuff, there's different brushes you can use with it that sort of replicates a real Japanese brush. So pressing softly, pressing more hard, would actually let these lines vary. But I don't have anywhere near that kind of skill with a brush, and I'm not about to try and learn it with this pencil. So, so I'm just coloring them in. It doesn't matter, we're working at such a large scale. But like right here, for example, a person that was really good with a brush and they knew what they were doing could make that hair, I'm sure, in one stroke. There's no way I'm capable of that. So I'm just going to color. I'm going to build it up. Here we go. A bit thicker. And a bit thicker. And by the time we shrink it down later today onto its tiny, tiny size, it'll look pretty much the same. But this could be done, I'm sure, much more beautifully if somebody had the, the skill and touch and taste for it. And I don't know. I don't know how well these pencils match real brushes. I don't know. Jensen uses both, you know, for some of the prints he does for us. He, he will s sketch it out and construct it in Photoshop first, using the mechanical brushes on his mouse. And then when it comes time for him to prepare the tracing for us to carve, he prints that out on a bunch of different pieces of paper and large tapes them all together, takes it to his light table, puts a sheet of thin tracing paper on top, and then with a real wet brush, a real ink brush, then redraws the whole thing. So he gets both. He gets to do composition in Photoshop and change and move the angle and stretch this and shrink this and play with the idea of what it should all look like. And then once it's composed, 
he then brushes it. Now a super genius would whatever would do both together. I mean the old the old original artist, the Utomaros or whatever, they would sketch and sketch and play and play and sketch and sketch. Then when it's ready, they would have the rough sketch. They put a sheet of paper on top and do the same thing. Draw the final beautiful one ready for the carver. So it's not so different actually what Jed's doing from what the real artists in the old days used to do. You know? What's happening? You've got something about the, the silkworm thing. It was a history of silkworms and one old photo using the hatching print. Really? Tell me more about this. You mean the print that we made with the, the grid the other day? They're using this. What were they using it for? Was it, was it, tell me, tell me, tell me, do we know? I'll be very interested to see this. Thank you, thank you, thank you. In the old days, the old, 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 old days, back in the Edo time, this would never have been the carver's job. Preparing the tracings was the job of, it's a combination of the, the designer sending stuff in, in sketch form and bit by bit more worked out. And then in the publisher's outfit, there were people who took those designs then and prepared the final tracings for the carver. And they would be doing a combination of of drawing over top of the artist's drawings slash sketches. They would be doing things like drawing in all the border lines, putting in the calligraphy for the series title if it was there and stuff like that. And then when that was ready, that little thin delicate sheet of paper, that went to the carver along with the piece of wood. And the carver would paste it down and get to work on it. But having said that, sometimes, and we've got leftover tracings to show this, sometimes they wouldn't even draw all the hairs like this one by one by one. There would just be a zone shown in gray wash here, carve hair here. And in the middle of the, of the zone, there would be one or two or three hairs drawn just to show the general scope and angle. But come the 20th century, and I've seen this on carver's desks, I know Ito-san and other people I've visited, the carver gets stuck with this sometimes. The publishing company, 20th century, reproduction company, will send the guy a photograph, and he's supposed to take the tracing paper on top of the photograph and trace it and paste it on a carver. And the lazy habit of doing that is one reason why many of these, here's our garbage pickup, many of the 20th century reproductions vary so much from the original. We saw that in the collection over there, we were talking about this the other day, we have three versions in the collection of a specific print reproduced three times in the 20th century. And they're all dramatically different in, in line work. Now this part, these kimono lines, this is already done and carved, but I'm going to put some of these lines on here because this is how I'm going to be able to line them up. In my, when I print out this tracing later today or tomorrow, I need to have a way to line it up with the work that's already carved. So if I put some of these lines on it all the way around the edge of this thing, I 
on this part, this line you see extending down here to the bottom, this is going to get, help me line this thing up with the part that's already carved, because that line is already carved on our block. Ah, look at this too. He's made the eyebrow and it's bumping into the hair. Interesting. There's our vacuum lady, 842. Who needs a clock with all these events that happen every day, same time, same station? The shoe lady came by today at 846. 856, sorry, 856. You almost said, you might catch her, you know, if she gets one train late. If she's on one, the next train, instead of her normal train, then you'll catch her. That's the Oshibori truck. Life in a sock side, nine o'clock every morning. downright noisy out there today. I have the outside camera set up today, but it's not plugged into the machine. I didn't think I could do with too many video feeds today. So the audio you're hearing from outside all comes from the pin mic on my shirt at the moment. That's the only audio going into this feed here today. <laughs> One noise after another. If we were doing this out at my home in Ome, all you'd be hearing was peen and the sound of the river rolling by, you know. But here in Asakusa, in the middle of Tokyo, my God, just whatever, whatever. <laughs> I keep moving off screen, do I? Sorry. I'm, I have actually, as you can see from the top right, I have a full view of this, but the the casting thing casts the whole window. I don't want to muck with it, but the, the, the I'm using one window to hide another window because I don't want to show.
Okay, again, just put a few of these in. These are already carved on the block, but if I just put a couple of them in here now, this will help me line things up when it comes time to paste this down. What is going on up there today? It's insane. They're obviously jackhammering out the concrete floor of the old restaurant, the restaurant on the corner that closed a few months ago. We weren't sure, remember we talked about it, we weren't sure if the building was coming down or if it was gonna be a renovation, and the building's staying, which is surprising, because remember we talked about this, since OG was trying to reclaim their garden wall, and it seems like they're not. And, uh, so that building is staying, I guess. Do I still have the kingfishers living next to the stream behind the home in Ome? I guess so. You're asking the wrong guy. I never get out there anymore. I'm out there like once every few months. So I don't know. I assume they're there. I know in recent years, the community out there has been much more careful of taking care of that river. When I first moved there, there was frequent oil slicks in it from a gas station, a car repair shop up, up river. That stopped. So bit by bit by bit, it's been getting cleaner and neater over the years. The generation of old guys who just chucked shit everywhere and didn't care about it, those old guys are, are passing away one by one, and the new leaders of the community have grown up, you know, with a new ethic, obviously, the way that things should be taken care of. So over the course of a generational change, the place is being much more carefully taken care of. And actually, we were part of that, moving up there. I was really noisy, uh, noisy meaning, you know, I was a troublemaker in the beginning. When I saw those oil slicks, I got out there, took some samples, put it, went to City Hall, complained. I was a bit of a troublemaker, but... Uh, but bit by bit, the, the thing has changed into a sensible way of doing things, and... Uh, the river, as far as I know, I haven't been there recently, but the river now is really, really clean. And there was two, there was a grandfathered sewage situation. The city, this is before I moved there about 20 years ago. The city was, they had sewers, of course, in the central area, but Ome is a bit of a strange place. It's hugely wide area, but the rural parts are very sparsely settled. The central core, of course, is okay. And in the old, old, old days, it was septic tanks all around. There was no sewage system. So at some point, maybe 30, 40 years ago, the sewers were built in the central core and extended out bit by bit by bit. But it gets to a point, it must be the same in any city, where there's a rural area outside, how far do you run your sewer lines? When there's only one house two miles down the road there, you don't run a sewer line all the way down. He's left to his own devices on his septic tank. And some of the really, really, really older houses in Omaha, and we're talking pre-war, they didn't even have septic tanks. There was little local streams, they just dumped from their house directly into it. You know, don't get the idea that happens in Japan now, but this was grandfathered stuff. You have a little old couple, they were 80 years old, living in a little semi-shack up in the mountain area, and they had never been either sewered or septic tanked. And the city, rather than give them a bill for 5,000 bucks, you must do this. The city's like, look, they're 85 years old. Let's not worry about it. So nobody really stressed that. And when I moved into the Ome house, there was still one such house up the stream from me, three, 400 yards. And it was a really elderly couple. They had been there for a million years. And their washing machine went straight into the river. And their sewage went straight into the river, too. And as I said, it's unacceptable, but the community sort of, like, we know where this is going. So it was sort of a bit of a sensible situation, I think. And they passed away, and that's it. Within days, the bulldozers were there, that place was gone. And of course, anybody building there new has to get, uh, has to take care of their sewage properly. So as far as I know, and I did, I walked up and down, up and down that river, top to bottom when I first moved there. I, I sketched the whole thing out. 
there's nobody left on the river that's running behind my Omi house. There's no more, uh, there's no more washing machines or sewage going directly into that stream. You know. Did I take lessons to learn Japanese? No, I've never uh, studied Japanese at all. It's why my Japanese is so, uh, it's fractured. I can do daily communication, of course, no problem, I'm fine. Answer the phone, if it's a simple conversation, people won't even know I'm a foreigner, it's okay. So conversation's okay. What I have never done is I've never gone through the process of going to school and step one, step two, step three of learning all the kanji. So my, my uh, writing skills are next to zero. I don't write anything, having never had the practice of drawing all the, all the characters. So my speaking skills are fine, my comprehension skills are fine. That's the strongest one that comes when any of us are learning a new language. We, we understand what people are saying, even if we can't sometimes talk and explain it ourselves. So I have a mixed bag of skills. I, know I can get around in society perfectly, run a business, own a house, do all that sort of stuff, do day-by-day -day things, give speeches, go on the media. <clears throat> but the writing skills are zero, and the reading skills are, I'm about at a level of, I don't know, no idea. I haven't done any tests. My, my skills are pointillistic. Rather than learning grade one, finished grade two, finished grade three, finished like the Japanese do, I've learned things pointed here and there, here and there. So I have a sort of a a pointillistic view of the language. Again, daily life, no problem. Train stations, where am I going? Who am I? What's going on? It's okay. Ask me to read a, a political analysis page in the newspaper and I'm going to very quickly get in trouble, start stumbling. But it's interesting, society is changing very much around me here and that where 20, 30 years ago, my lack of ability to write characters would have been a real handicap. These days it doesn't matter. Every kid is in the same position. They're just, they, they, they do it in school and then pop, never do it again, so they forget it. So I'm in the same position as the new generation of young Japanese, where they can sort of read a bit, but they can't write, if you give them a, a piece of paper and a pencil. Oh, I'm drawing off screen. Sorry, I forgot where I am here. I can see the whole screen, but I didn't realize you guys can't. Sorry. Sorry, 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 sorry. Let's move on. What haven't we done? There's lots of places to go here. How do I erase here? How do I erase? There's an undo. Oh, no, erase. 
That's an eraser, is it? Okay. Are we tracing for a future woodcut? We're tracing for the one that's under production right now. If you've just stepped into the stream here, up in the top corner here, the block I'm carving at the moment, the carving has been coming along very well, but as you can see the face, here's the face right now. The face is not yet carved, and it's turned out that when I looked closely at it, it's too blurred. The tracing was just a photocopy rather than carefully produced. So I've paused that work for a minute on this block. I'm going back to the original image, tracing now carefully the faces and hair. I will print it out on thin gumpy paper, try lining it up and paste it down and then carve again. And as I mentioned before a few minutes ago, I'm also on this tracing, I'm drawing some of these support lines below the, the boy's face because those lines are already carved. And after I print out my tracing, I'll be able to line it up together with those lines. So we've paused the carving work for a minute to roll back and do something I should have done when I started the job. I should have prepared this at the beginning. I thought I could get away with it. What time is it? 8.58, show and tell. And we do have a show and tell today. It's going to be a simple one. It's, it's one package that has arrived from uh, an auction a couple of weeks ago. This one took a long time to get here. So it's, it's just one print to show you who and ah, uh, and then we'll be done. So it's not a very extensive show and tell. But it's a nice, 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 nice print. Also, speaking about the show and tell and stuff, I have to wonder, you know, there were a bunch of auctions last night, uh, yesterday afternoon and yesterday evening here in Japan. This was open public auctions on the Yahoo auction site. And there were four or five prints by Okuyama Gihachiro. You know, we talked about him a few weeks ago. He showed some prints that I had got. I've been ignoring him for many, many years. He's sort of an in-between type person. But the work is attractive, and I shouldn't have ignored it. So in recent weeks, I've been picking them up here and there where I can get some. And we've talked about them on this stream, which is getting a lot of actually view on replay. I don't know how many people are here watching live today, but uh, people watching on replay. And whether there's a connection or not, I have no idea. But these auctions yesterday for the Okuyama Gihachiro prints went to like double or triple the price that they normally go to. And what? I should have kept quiet about this stuff. I should have scooped up everything in sight first before I publicly talked about this stuff. Well, I don't know, maybe it's not just this, it's maybe it, his time has come, I don't know. But anyway, last night I just had to watch it all go by. It was way too expensive for me last night. So I missed them all. So all, all four, all four or five, I can't remember. Beautiful prints. They were not such great condition, actually. So people, I think people were overpaying for these things, you know. It's not Procreate, it's a Pixel Mater. It's just a simple Photoshop clone. I don't need special, all I need is just simply two layers, a base layer to look at and a transparent layer to, to, to sketch into, to, to trace into. I've heard about that Procreate, I don't know, I guess I think it's mainly for, for artists, people who are actually creating new work. All I need here is a simple tracing ability and Pixelmator, the program that's running here, costs 600 yen, about you know, six bucks, five bucks and it will read and write PSD files. So I started this on the Mac in Photoshop, cast it over, air, air, air dropped it over to the pad, and opened it here in uh, Pixelmator. And I'll do the same, I'll save it up when I'm finished, air drop it back to the Mac, 
and using the Photoshop on the Mac, I will scale it to the proper size, print it out on a laser, and paste it on the block. How is the smudging on the original? So, it, this is interesting, eh? See, this is why people all the time tell me, Dave, you don't need to trace this. Just click and Photoshop will take care of it for you. Photoshop can't take care of it for me. You can see right now this, this smudging. Let's get the print and have a look at it. Excuse me here while we have a look at this. Okay, what is it? It's gray. What they've done, they've done something. Yeah, I'll be doing the same thing when I come to the color blocks. What they've done with this print is, there's a, mm, where's the best place to talk to you about this? Here's a print. It's a key, it's key block, we're <laughs> exactly the wrong angle with it. It's key block in colors. So they did the key block first, then they carved colors, an orange color, a pink color, a red color, blah, 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 blah. There is a gray color printed underneath the hair here. Yeah, so exactly, somebody's got a gray undertone to fill out the hair. And what they've done with the gray undertone, at the edge of it, they've actually chopped. He's done this, he's actually done this. At the edge of the hair, he's, he hasn't matched them up one by one, but he's just sort of feathered it roughly. There's one place where there's one gray hair coming out down. You can see it here. You can see it. I can't draw on the... You can see it right below where I just drew the red. There is a gray hair coming down there. So that's the smudging that you are seeing. I hadn't even really thought about that myself, but yes, it's there. When I do it myself, I'm not sure. I don't know, whatever. I just mostly we need a gray undertone to help fill it out so that the black has a bit more density. And gray also is some of the colors. Some of the kimono colors are gray. So the gray isn't just for the hair. Yep. Somebody's leaving anyway. Thank you. Thanks for dropping in for a while. So, and if you were trying to tell Photoshop or whatever, hi, hey, click, click, automatically pull out these hairs, please. I can't imagine any, any software that is going to pull out this hair but leave the gray behind it. It's okay, it's our job to do this. I don't need to have everything automated or everything automatic. I got that quite a lot when I was doing the Great Wave stuff and the, the videos on that. There was lots and lots of commentary. Dave, you don't need to do this. It can be automatically done. And I'm sorry, it can't be automatically done. 